Just over a decade ago, back in October of 2012, YouTube, after catching on to flaws pervading their algorithm for recommending video content, decided as a site to change what determined a profitable video, switching their attention over from view count and other features to favoring watch time as a way of detecting engagement. This was done, according to YouTube, for the reason that tons of videos with engaging titles and thumbnails will get high click-through rates but low retention because, well, they were clickbait. So this change meant that now, longer videos keeping viewer attention would get recommended more often and receive higher ad revenue. But while that might have sounded logical in writing, when put into practice, it quickly became apparent that a large section of the community was basically exiled with few exceptions, those being high quality, short form content creators. Or more specifically for the sake of this video, animators. Now I don't know how much of you actually know what it is I'm talking about here. YouTube says most of my audience is 18 to 34 and I highly doubt that. But back before the 2012 days, YouTube had a bit of a renaissance for animation content, acting as the new home for several creators from Newgrounds.com, a website for animation and flash games that still exists today. That's where Friday Night Funkin' came from, kids. But thanks to that algorithm shift, nowadays the field of amateur traditional animation is way smaller, and those once popular creators have since scattered far and wide. A stray few like Psychic Pebbles and Michael Cusack left YouTube entirely to work in the pro industry and made it big with their own original series, but a majority, having gotten used to the YouTube lifestyle, chose to stay and keep chasing the bag no matter what. So in order to do that, they had to adapt. Possibly the most well-known examples of this are Ego Raptor or Aaron Hansen, who went from creating video game parody animations and critique videos to doing Let's Plays with friends on his now better known channel The Game Grumps, and Oni and G, who similarly created a gaming spin-off Oni Plays. But that's not to say it became impossible for old animators to keep going with the craft. They just needed to shake up their methods for revenue so they didn't have to worry about not eating. Speedoru and Harry Partridge are two that instantly come to mind in that regard, as they both use Patreon and, in Speedoru's case, take animation commissions from others to stay on the up and up. But really, that's still not the same as keeping themselves afloat through YouTube alone. And due to, as mentioned, how time-consuming the practice is, now split between that and non-YouTube work, their output is fairly slow. But for every two extremes, there has to be a middle ground. Some inventive, creative in-between that's not quite as time-consuming to create, not quite as disregarding of the medium, but with enough effort to show true talent and professionalism while keeping it efficiently made. Something so unique you can't help but go hot diggity. D demon that's the name of the channel. Originally known for creating one of YouTube's first viral animated series, The Jerry Saga, Max Gilardi, aka Hot Diggity Demon, has been honing his craft for almost two decades online, having created original series, one-off animations, and parodies, all of which carried a uniquely cynical, dry sense of humor with occasional deeper commentary and heart. And okay, sometimes they could be pretty edgy purely for edgy sake, but there was usually something more there, which helped him stand out among the crowd. And regardless of whether you like Max's older content or not, one undeniable fact is that he was always steadily improving his craft, becoming more adept at performing impressions and voices, learning how to not only use 2D or CGI animations separately, but together, taking on a large range of styles, experimenting with his presentation. Undoubtedly, he was near the forefront of the culture when it came to technical skill. So among the former Newgrounds animators that chose to take a different approach after YouTube's algorithm continually changed to go against them, his eventual new content was by far the most competently executed, with the least change from his previous brand, taking all the ambitious content he'd created over the years and distilling it into his magnum opus, Brain Dump the clickbaitiest show on the internet. And it really is a testament to all that Max has done over the years, being designed for the sake of coming out more frequently without diminishing his creative output or room for experimentation. On a conceptual level, in the beginning, the series focuses on Max, played by himself, analyzing animated media using a persona that gets into wacky hijinks. And already, that gives him so much to work with from a utilitarian perspective. I mean, the entire body of the character Max portrays himself with is a 3D puppet, meaning it's infinitely reusable and capable of lively movement without him needing to create new assets or draw them frame by frame. And the same is true of the space around his animated living room, as it's already been pre-rendered and given detail from all angles. So that means the character has plenty of space to move around in that's visually distinct without Max needing to spend time creating new backgrounds. And it doesn't stop at what Max himself has created. Remember, Brain Dump is technically a media analysis series, and that means he can use portions of whatever media he's talking about to fill up space when need be, cutting down on the time it would take to make 
make all the assets himself. But don't go thinking Max is lazy now, he totally uses these self-imposed restraints to go as far as he can in all other means of expression, including literally. The few parts of his character that aren't done using CG are the eyes, mouth, and brows, meaning that while the 3D model has its limitations in terms of how cartoony it can move around, that's made up for by Max's hilarious facial animations. Though those are also reused after new expressions are created since the series is cost-effective. Plus, the body still moves more interestingly than most CG characters through a process Max calls slideshow animation. You see, normally, a computer would be able to fill in all the frames between the character performing one action and another, making for a really smooth transition without the animator needing to do basically anything. But Max chooses to go the extra mile and create a quicker feeling by manually removing any unnecessary frames and only having the character move suddenly when performing an action. Basically, everything his character does is very intentional, and when he isn't animating for his own persona, he's animating enjoyable little skits about the media he's discussing to give that extra bit of flavor to his visuals, or he's animating the other characters in his videos. After all, this isn't just any old media analysis series, it's, in ways, a parody of other media reviewers from the time, as in Nostalgia Critic, AVGN, Linkara, and the like, who all had little skits with a wide range of side characters who'd show up from time to time during reviews, so Max creates a satire of that with his own cast. The satire is that they're enjoyable. Okay, that's not really where the satire comes in, but they are entertaining, and seriously important to the setup of Brain Dump even in their early appearances, those being Burnbot, Max's insult-generating sentient TV that plays all the media clips for him, and Goofball the goofy cartoon ghost, a riff on antagonist characters in these kind of review shows that acts more like a Bugs Bunny type to Max's Elmer Fudd, constantly annoying him for the sake of it and pointing out Max's character flaws whenever possible. It's a fun little dynamic with a smidge of complexity when you realize that Max himself is the one writing and voicing Goofball to make fun of his character, so in a way, it's self-deprecating humor, but at the same time it isn't, since Max isn't insulting himself in the episode, but he also is... Y you get what I'm saying. On a base level, it's a classic Looney Tunes-style straight man and jackass routine. With a bit of knowledge, it's a man using his own insecurities for the sake of comedy. And it only gets more complex from there, slowly transitioning us into what I like to call true brain dump. Seeing as in the grand scheme of the series, the first 15 or so episodes are all meant to, when viewed in retrospect, help characterize the relationships of the main trio before sort of switching formats, displayed best in the Rogue One episode where Goofball completely derails the video talking about cereal, and the Moana episode, where the insecurities Goofball's been making fun of Max for become the highlight rather than just an offhand remark, and in doing so, it's taken more seriously. Max is actually depressed and feels bad about himself, so instead of ripping on him like he always does, Goofball tries his best to console him and get Max to open up about what specifically is causing his mood shift. It gives us a glimpse into who Goofball and Max truly are underneath their regular back and forth. A depressed, self-conscious, fake confident man with an ego complex and his roommate who, while he enjoys bringing levity to the situation, genuinely doesn't want his friend to be in pain, and only points out Max's flaws with the underlying hope that he'll not only acknowledge, but improve from them. And you might be wondering where Moana fits into all of this, but that's the thing. While Brain Dump sort of analyzes media in every episode up to this point, the media itself is just a springboard into a more general topic. And in this case, instead of the general topic having to do with other media, it has to do with Max as a character and how his opinion of it shapes his personality. Max the creator is using the motif of the series he's created to, instead of following the typical format he has set up, diverge into what Brain Dump is truly meant to be. A character-based comedy about a broken man trying to get over himself, and that becomes more apparent the further the series goes on. Like, for example, do you ever notice how Max the character, after a while, stops being the regular snarky internet persona for Max the creator, and ends up having a few traits to act as actual character flaws? I've already stated that he's depressed and has a hard time opening up to others, but aside from that, he also pretends to be smarter than he is, which he hates being called out for, and despite Goofball just cracking jokes for the sake of being a wise-ass, Max often likes to seriously blame him for why his life sucks. Of course, in the moment, if you were a passing viewer, you wouldn't bat an eye at the usage of these traits to make fun of Max, seeing as they're, at first, a side piece to the media criticism on display. But for viewers keeping track that continually tune in, they start to see that these behaviors aren't used for a gag and then forgotten, they're repeatedly brought up, and eventually, they start influencing Max 
to the extent that his issues take over the episode's premise. And that goes double for Goofball, who I've already mentioned turns out to be more than he seems. But he and Burnbot don't get their own spotlights until the start of True Brain Dump, when all that's been built up, hinted at, and foreshadowed in the background of the series comes to a head through a great, inciting incident. The video in question, Top 10 Reasons the Grinch is Bullshit, starts out exactly how we're accustomed to. Max tries talking about a film, in this case, why the Illumination version of the Grinch isn't really a villain like he used to be, seeing as he's only said to be a wicked person instead of physically doing anything worthy of being called one, and as you'd expect, Goofball keeps interrupting with bits, giving us the impression that this episode's deeper analogy has to do with him instead of Max for once. But really, this is just a subversion, so we don't see it coming when Max, through one action, cements all the behavior Goofball has criticized him for over the past 15 episodes. He claims that Burnbot isn't able to think after Goofball teases that she said Brain Dump sucks. And instead of apologizing for hurting her feelings, he doubles down, saying that she doesn't have any cognitive thought for no other reason than to prove that he's right. As mentioned, Max the character has an obsession with looking smart, never being wrong, and keeping his emotions limited to snark when possible. So while he might deep down be sorry for what he said, his ego won't allow him to admit it, whether intentional or not. And that causes Burnbot to leave. But Max can't comprehend that idea, so he falls back on his other known behavior and blames Goofball for her leaving. Which is the moment where the audience should understand that all the time Max has spent saying Goofball makes him miserable, that wasn't really the case. Rather, it was Max making himself miserable, as he refuses to take accountability for his own actions or choices and tends to get seriously mad at Goofball's teasing because he doesn't want to acknowledge he's the maker of his own destiny. And many of the things Goofball teases him for are problems that Max has created of his own accord, exemplified in Burnbot's departure. This is the real moment where it clicks that the person, Max Gilardi, and the character, Max of Brain Dump, are two different entities rather than the same person. Max the creator does still voice and use his character in Brain Dump to mirror many of his own issues and struggles, helping to humanize Max the character and keep him relatable, but now that Brain Dump has become so detached from reality, we can infer that it's stopped pretending to be your average internet review show. In the Grinch video, he barely talks about the film at all, and seeing as Burnbot was the one providing visual accompaniment to begin with, if she's gone, that means there's no way for Max to show clips. And that translates into the next set of episodes, which choose to focus more on developing Max and Goofball's characters, while coming up with wacky substitutes for Brain Dump's regular presentation of content. At first, Max tries to directly keep performing the media analysis he did with Burnbot, but he's unable to replicate it and isn't willing to accept Goofball's help, so when that doesn't work out, he moves on to doing other common deviations in content that people who make reviews have been known to do. D&D campaigns, talk shows, let's plays, but aside from them all being mimicked in an obviously tongue-in-cheek way, each episode slowly reveals more about Max and his crumbling psyche. The Deadpool episode shows him disheveled, longing for Burnbot and looking for any excuse out of his current situation, whether it's continually blaming Goofball for his life being ruined or thinking of joining the army so he can die. Then, when longing for death doesn't help with his situation, Max, without us needing to be told, tries to find an escape for his situation through D&D. But even in a fantasy land, he can't help but project his own hatred onto others, making the world of his creation one where everyone's as depressed as he is. Max doesn't know how to be happy or content to begin with, so how can he imagine what happiness is like? If he were more open to suggestion, he could ask Goofball, who's been both of those things for the entirety of Brain Dump, always wearing a smile on his face, but Max is still too insecure and full of himself to do that, so like with Burnbot, he instead chooses to bring Goofball down, inevitably perpetuating a never-ending cycle of those that get close to him slowly backing away. And the only reason Goofball doesn't is whether Max can see it or not, he is a good friend that cares about Max's feelings and wants him to get out of this rut. The Sonic interview is a testament to that. Goofball sees Max spiraling and attempts to reason with him, dropping the intentionally annoying cartoony antics to tell him he should respect Burnbot's feelings and apologize instead of letting himself mentally crash off a bridge in the interest of holding on to the idea that he didn't do anything wrong. And at the heart of it all, as stated, Max knows he isn't in the right, but can't admit it, so with nowhere left to turn, having exacerbated all options, Max completely shows out and goes for a let's play as a last form of escapism. Ironically though, in that episode more than any others before it, his true thoughts aren't hard to decode, though you do have to be paying attention as, on the surface, it looks like a regular gameplay video with a little added production quality. But hey, that's what Brain Dump did for media criticism to begin with, so anyone that's been following along in the timeline should be able to see the real meaning. Max creates a kingdom around a village in Minecraft where he calls the villagers friends, but he's paranoid that they'll run off so he builds a massive wall around them, has a barracks for them to sleep in, and blocks off any means of exits. No one important is leaving on his watch, but in 
inadvertently in doing this, we suddenly see the villagers planning methods of escape across the episode. One of them poisons Max's food, some get away but are led back, others try to kill themselves. It's clear they aren't happy, yet Max continues to lord over them, oblivious to the fact that he's causing harm for those he claims to care about. He'll go into a panic attack when they end up hurting themselves on the block that he sets up, but he doesn't see how any of it was his fault. How he was the one to set up this scenario in the first place. If they'd only fallen in line and didn't go against him, it would have been fine. But they all had to be stupid and selfish and ruin what they had going for them when all Max wanted them to do was keep on working for his benefit without any complaints. And if that's not enough for you to understand what I'm getting at, there's some interesting dialogue that's a smidge more easily interpretable. See, now you got hurt. That was your own fault. Because you're an idiot. Me and the village boys hanging out. And do they appreciate what I do? No. That's a no. Absolutely not. God! My only friend! I can't lose you! Of course, it's all subtext, and that's the genius of the episode, as depending on your knowledge, you could see it as either a regular Minecraft Let's Play or a satire of them, but regardless, with our knowledge of the situation, it isn't hard to see that Max needs to finally get over himself. And thankfully, in the next episode, he does just that. The guy's ego has faltered in the wake of losing all that he held precious, and though he still doesn't quite perceive the root cause of why all this happened to begin with, he does know that he messed up by not apologizing and bottling his feelings up. So he comes clean. And more than that, he also apologizes for everything else he's been told he needs to apologize for, whether seriously or not. And that really speaks to what's so great about Brain Dump in the first place. It's got the capacity to be serious when it wants to be, and it pulls off genuine emotions surprisingly surprisingly well, but it never gets so melodramatic it's above making fun of itself. Hell, that's an exact point from the first episode of Brain Dump when discussing what another piece of media would need in order to get themes across more proficiently. So Max seemed to know what he wanted to do with the series from its inception. And now that the status quo has been returned, with a few shakeups along the way, we've come to the precipice of that vision wherein Brain Dump has stopped being about movies and fully embraced being about... Max. We've seen him as an egotistical critic, an oppressed shell unwilling to face the music, a broken man on the verge of collapse, and with those sides of his character so thoroughly explored, these latest six episodes I'm able to cover are going to comedically deconstruct what makes him that way in the first place without losing its comedic edge or ability to be viewed out of context. All beginning with a simple Saturday night cartoon. Literally, but that's the title of the video. And boy, what a cartoon it is. Looking at it from a purely, well, visual perspective, it's by far the most impressive a brain dump episode has looked. Max really knows how to portray a drug trip in the most interesting way possible, and other than being a fun experiment in the same kind of kaleidoscope optical illusions he used in the Doctor Strange review, it also works as a slow transition into the deconstructive elements I mentioned earlier. Kind of like how the series went from using media analysis in the forefront with characters in the background to characters characters in the forefront with media as a background element for constructing a narrative, here, we're going from one-off adventures with small inklings of deeper character in the background, to them becoming more prominent themes. For example, in Saturday Night Cartoon, Max is perturbed by the lack of action going on in his life and longs for new experiences, but when Goofball gives that exact want to him in the form of ghost drugs, he immediately regrets it because, though he enjoys dreaming about and complaining that he'll never get to have new experiences, he's way too self-conscious and lazy to follow through. In simple terms, he's a pussy, a pussy that doesn't want to leave his comfort zone, yet hopes for things to change in some kind of ambiguous way when he knows they won't. Unable to key into how this exact lifestyle is why he can't change his life for the better. He's never allowed himself to enjoy the moment without overthinking or getting in his own way. And that's why he's mad at Goofball for giving him shrooms. He's lost the ability to back out. He can't run away. He has been forced to enjoy it. And moving forward from there, his other mechanism for remaining stagnant in life, his over-reliance on his own wits to make decisions for him is broken down through Goofball fucking with him and lying using claims Max can't possibly disprove, so he's left having to rely on the stupidest bullshit imaginable, self-help. And I totally buy it. Because Max has never been all that much of a scientific character. For sure, he used science to prove his stances and positions when he thought it would benefit him, but in other scenarios, the concept of science could be interchanged for whatever other source he needed to justify his actions. He wasn't a man of science, he was a benefactor that followed it so he didn't have to think and introspect. So it's no wonder that after his faith in science is shaken, he turns to self-help and the power of wanting. Like, why wouldn't he? Max believes he's been dealt an unfair hand in life while everyone else has been able to enjoy themselves, so naturally, the universe must be in the midst of shifting to correct its mistake and give Max all the luxuries he's ever wanted. And then finally, 
he'll be content. But that's not going to happen, and he's never going to get any of the things he supposedly wants due to his basic mentality in life. He feels like he's owed some kind of reward that'll never come for his trials and tribulations. But the only reason he faced those trials to begin with was himself never having the ambition or courage to go out and look for them. But in reality, he doesn't need fancy cars or beautiful women to feel happy and fulfilled. All he needs to do is change his outlook. Stop thinking about how he's messed up in the past and look to the future. Stop staring so high above at all the things he'll never have and aim for the simple pleasures within his reach. Goofball sure knows how to do that. In the episode where Max goes off the rails claiming his life is over and he'll never feel accepted, Goofball is playing with a pen instead of paying attention. He's too caught up in having fun, making spontaneous decisions and living in the moment to care about Max's overly critical self-ranting about his life. But that's not to say Max's fears are unwarranted. They're super real and obviously draw from the creator's own personal thoughts. But in a way, Brain Dump is meant as a sort of therapy for people who've dealt with the same issues and need some reassurance that they don't need to overthink so much. They just need to live for the day and make of it what they see fit. And the same idea applies to personal achievements. You could spend all the time in the world saying you blew your chance of becoming an artist or whatever and wallowing in the lack of artistic recognition you deserve, but as long as there's at least one person who takes value from your work, it shouldn't matter how much credit you receive. You're important to someone, and that makes you an important person. But for Max's situation, situation in particular, it goes beyond wanting recognition, it also encompasses making money. So in order to create content that'll get him appreciation as well as moolah, in possibly the creator's best episode yet, he sells out to a big company that wants him to make a video discussing the modern eight or nine definitions of fascism. Except he's completely out of his depth and doesn't know a single thing about the topic. All he's doing is putting his faith into another entity he believes is smarter that'll give him the respect he's so long desired, and hey, it's suppressing issue, so if he covers this important subject like the corporations want him to, that means by extension he's an important person who makes important art. But considering he is so incompetent and dumb, Max doesn't realize that, in spreading the idea that fascism has eight or nine definitions, whether he truly believes it or not, he's playing into what the corporations want him to do. Yeah, on a base level without any subtextual thinking, you could see the joke of the episode simply being that fascism has slowly been made less clear as a concept by people that don't know what it actually means and use it anyway for whatever reason. But when you dig just a bit deeper, there's way more. I mean, think about it. Max is being told by sleazy corporations represented as the devil himself that nobody knows what fascism is. And in spite of that, rather than giving clarity to the subject, the corporations want him to spread the idea that it has eight or nine definitions. Why else would they want that other than to distance from the real meaning, which they are implied to represent? Shit, both the CEO and Max, in attempting to follow their wishes, ends up exhibiting several marks for the classic determiner for a fascist government, Umberto Eco's 14 points. One, the cult of tradition. The idea that truth is already known and knowledge doesn't need to be progressed. Max inherently believes, based on the corporations, that fascism has eight or nine definitions which are all equally on the rise and need to be talked about with the same urgency. Three, the cult of action for action's sake. The idea that action needs to be taken without any prior thinking. Describes Max's situation perfectly. He doesn't understand the concept, but he thinks measures need to be taken regardless. Four, disagreement is treason. Ignoring nuance and believing alternate viewpoints are sacrilege. When Goofball doesn't take the subject with any of the same reverence that Max believes he's supposed to, he gets incredibly angry. 6. Appeal to social frustration. The most easily exploitable people are the economically downtrodden middle class. And Max is in dire need of the money this sponsorship would pay him. The same sponsor that's willing to threaten him knowing Max's lack of wealth. 7. Obsession with a plot. The people need to be felt as though there's a group out to get them. And in Max's case, Goofball is the obvious scapegoat. Yeah, Max may have been the one that wanted to enact positive social change but didn't know how, so he got himself roped into a scheme by evil corporations to downplay the true meaning of fascism. But Goofball drank a glass of milk and said it was cum. And you know, Goofball has always been Max's scapegoat for taking accountability, so it makes sense he'd be used for the analogy. 10 contempt for the weak. Elitism is common in reactionary ideology. The corporation believes that Max doesn't create good art and is easily dispensable. 12. Machismo. A disdain for women and anything sexually out of the norm. The CEO is directly shown hitting women, and when told Max got his logo covered in cum vomit, is appalled. 14. Newspeak. Fascism promotes an impoverished, unspecific vocabulary to limit critical thought. Max literally looks up the definition of fascism in the dictionary, and it's said to be eight or nine things. In a vacuum, there's such small 
small touches in the writing, but once you see them and pick up on the patterns, the intention and subtext becomes all too clear. And what's also equally as great about it is that you don't need to know anything about Umberto Eco or the 14 points to get what this video is trying to say. Purely through the imagery and dialogue, you can pick up on how massive corporations, in an attempt to look noble and divert attention away from their own fascistic tactics, will state that fascism is divided into several definitions that we should all equally care about. Confusing the masses and making it less likely that their, by definition, fascist actions will get called out. Meaning, they can continue to profit. And if still you don't get that much, you can watch the episode for how it portrays Max as a character. So desperate to make an impact in the world and discard his past work, he shows out to a corporation that uses him as a puppet, but even so, he still finds it impossible to make it as an artist, portraying a real struggle. Or if you don't care about any of that, you can have a good time watching a man frantically attempting to disprove that a ghost drank cum on screen and degrade himself looking through vomit. That's the thing about good complex art. There's a ton of ways to unpack it if you want, but if you don't or can't, it still has plenty of value, possibly for wholly different reasons. And isn't that the perfect way to describe Brain Dump as a series? You can view it for the media analysis, or you can view it for the characters. You can enjoy it for the comedy, or you can enjoy it for the introspective, deeper conversation. You can be engaged by the animation, or be engaged by the writing. You can be one and done, or binge it. You can see it as a satirical take on a man's life, or a way for him to vent his frustrations constructively. It's got a little something for everybody. Not to mention the quality of voice acting and animation are always improving, each episode gives a completely different experience so you never get bored, and no matter what, Brain Dump never talks down to you as a viewer. It respects your intelligence and tailors itself so people of any persuasion can be entertained. According to Max G, it's going to change up its format again following what is fascism, and all I have to say is that I'm excited to see what's next. I've been Just Stop, this has been my Brain Dump review of the week, and I hope you hated it.